I'm going to talk a little bit about books, and in particular this anthology called Poems to Enjoy. Now this is one of the original issues of the book, the original copies of the book. Uh, there were, uh, it's more or less the same, but this was the founder. This was published in 1960, together with uh, four other books, plus two books for teachers, so there were seven books in all. And I'm surprised, really, that this has lasted all the way since 1960, but it has, and uh, in a sense, it's uh, still going strong. It was done on rather crude paper. Uh, I don't know whether in 1960, uh, Singapore, where it was published, was just recovering from the First World War, which had been over for quite a number of years, but nevertheless the publications that were produced in that year and uh, in previous years were fairly basic in their design. And this is fairly basic in its design. Nevertheless, it has survived since 1960. Uh, and I think that, in a sense, is quite extraordinary. I think it's quite extraordinary that I've survived myself since 1960. <laughs> there we are. Um, I think that uh, poetry is very much of local interest in Hong Kong. Uh, we have the um, Out Loud, which meets regularly at the Fringe Club, and there is a great deal of interest in poetry, which I think is interesting in itself. Why should people who may consider that they were tortured when they were at school by having to learn some poems and recite them perhaps, why should they continue that as adults? But in Hong Kong, it's a very popular activity, and uh, every time this organization meets, it's uh, crowded, people enjoy not only the drinks that are supplied, but also listening to each other, uh, and uh, they believe that they're benefiting by the different kinds of poems that they hear spoken. So I think that's very interesting in Hong Kong today, that there is this interest. The same sort of interest uh, continues in London. And a number of years ago, we were, happened to be in London for a very short period, and we visited the headquarters of an organization that uh, offers poetry as one of its activities, its main activity, in fact. And it was pretty dismal. We visited in the, the late afternoon. Uh, it looked not very clean. Uh, they were providing uh, drinks of various kinds. But uh, I don't think that either of us would have cared to have uh, drunk out of any of the cups that they were using. <laughs> However, having said that, uh, we were there only last year. And completely different. Very clean, very well ordered, and there were something like 70 people there in the basement. And they were all there to read their poetry. And they had a, a, a question master who was very strict. So everybody was restricted to whatever it was, two minutes, three, minutes. three, three minutes, minutes, something like that. And it was quite interesting to hear the, the different poems that were being read uh, and, and I think enjoyed by most people. One interesting feature of that was that we met uh, a descendant of, Robert, of uh, Laurence Olivier, who was a regular attender at one of these meetings. And since Lawrence was perhaps one of the greatest speakers of English in his time, uh, it was quite interesting that here was a, um, a grandson, I think, uh, attending this, uh, this group. It was to Donald Moore in 1959, 1959, far before any of you here were born this afternoon, that I suggested that it could be useful for learners and teachers in Singapore and elsewhere to have poetry collections that were interesting, that were lively and easily accessible. And I must have called Donald Moore in a soft moment because he said, yes, go ahead. 
and we'll arrange for it to be published. I then went, I was then the head of a department of the Teachers Training College. I went to the bursar and I said, I can't do this at home, I'm, I'm trying to write this program, I'm trying to produce these books. Um, is there any space I could use on a confidential basis? A very kind man, Mr. Devon his name was, I remember, found me a little room which was off a classroom. I don't know if they have that design today, but you had the classroom, then you had a little room going off it. So he allowed me to use one of these little rooms, he gave me the key, I could work, I could leave everything, lock the door and go away, come back and everything was still there. And, and that's what I did for quite a long time to produce this uh, anthology. Um, I read very, very many poems at that time and I made selections uh, in what I believed would be appropriate for different age groups. I spent two or sometimes three nights a week in that tiny room after the official work for the day had come to an end. The result of these efforts was five books for students and two accompanying books for teachers. They were all published in 1960 and they were reprinted in 1961. A third impression was made in 1969 Mommy. and they still keep coming out. That's a long time ago now. We were all babies at that time. Except I was, for you. Except I was, uh, except for you. <laughs> After I arrived in Hong Kong, my wife Gillian for some reason impressed by these books, contacted the commercial press, the well-known press in Hong Kong. And after a while, one of the then editors, a lady named Easter, contacted us quite enthusiastically. She selected from the five books, there were five books and two teachers' books, she selected from the five books uh, and arranged recordings of the selected poems. The two readers were children, both now grown-ups, previous winners in the Hong Kong Schools Music and Speech Association annual festival, and they were the top in their particular category. So, the three books by then were published with accompanying tapes. The people still had tapes. Easter, this is the name of this lady, also arranged a Taiwanese edition uh, in one book only. Now after this second Hong Kong edition was sold out, we decided that it would be nice to have a new third edition restoring the poems that were omitted by this lady, nice though she was, <laughs> in the second edition. And so we integrated the teacher's material with the poetry anthologies and published the whole as five books, not as seven, as in the original first edition. We converted, at least Julian did because I couldn't possibly do it, we converted the second edition recordings to digital format, whatever that might mean, but we did that, and recorded the poems not recorded for the second edition. Uh, all the poems are now read either by myself or by Julian. Now this afternoon I'm limiting myself with reluctance to very brief introductions of book one and book five. I believe that what I wrote in the preface to book one 56 years ago is still valid. I said 56 years ago that the keynote of the poetry lesson should be enjoyment and if the children or the adults didn't enjoy it that would be a, a great shame. So the keynote should be enjoyment and if this uh, relates to schools then a discerning teacher of experience can gauge, one hopes, without much difficulty whether or not 
his or her students have enjoyed themselves. Uh, and that's extremely important, particularly in the Hong Kong context. Are they doing it because they have to do it, because it's an exam, or are they doing it because they're actually enjoying it? I wrote that if they had, he or she, the teacher, might consider the lesson to have been a success. Uh, if not, he or she would have to accept the fact that the lesson had partially failed and it was therefore appropriate to think again about the purpose of the lesson and the approach to it. Now, book one is divided into two sections, poems to speak and poems to act and dance. In poems to speak, we have a number of traditional poems. For example, Bow wow, says the dog. Mew mew, says the cat. Grunt, grunt, goes the hog. And squeak, goes the rat. To woo, says the owl. Caw, caw, says the crow. Quack, quack, says the duck. And moo, says the cow. Children very often like that. Not all of them, <laughs> but most of them like it. And they like to make those noises. And in the section, Poems to Act and Dance, we illustrate the example of persistence. Incy wincy spider climbed the water spout. Down came the rain and washed poor spider out. Out came the sunshine, dried up all the rain. Incy wincy spider climb the spout again. That's a good example of persistence. Keep at it. You will succeed in the end like the spider. Now at that level, word games can be quite popular. Uh, and it's the teacher's job to make sure that they are popular, but I'm sure most teachers can. For example, there's a face game, which most children like. Not all, but most like knock at the knocker, forehead, pull the bell, ear, peep through the keyhole, eyes, lift the latch, nose, and walk in, mouth. For some reason children quite like that and uh, you get them to do it two or three times and they will enjoy it. Then we have uh, another little uh, poem in the same uh, anthology, page 84, called Stirring. Stir the soup in the pot, make it nice and hot. Round and round and round and round, stir the soup in the pot. They like that too. <laughs> Part one in book five contains poems which are especially suitable for speaking, either by individuals or by groups. Part two paints pictures in words and describes persons and animals and scenes. All the poems in part three are narrative poems, meaning they tell stories. One of my own favorites in part one is Hilaire Belloc's poem, Tarantella. Do you remember an inn, Miranda? Do you remember an inn? And the tedding and the spreading of the straw for a bedding, and the fleas that tease in the high Pyrenees, and the wine that tasted of the tar, and the cheers and the jeers of the young muleteers under the vine of the dark veranda. Do you remember an inn veranda? Do you remember an inn? And the cheers and the jeers of the young muleteers who hadn't got a penny and who weren't paying any. And the hammer of the doors and the din. And the hip hop hap 
of the clap to the hands to the twirl and the swirl of the girl gone chancing, glancing, dancing, backing and advancing, snapping of the clapper to the spin, out and in, and the ting, tong, tang of the guitar. Do you remember an inn, Miranda? Do you remember an inn? Never more, Miranda. Never more. Only the high peaks hoar and Aragon a torrent at the door. No sound in the walls of the halls where falls the tread of the feet of the dead to the ground. No sound but the boom of the far waterfall like doom. Uh, that's, that's a sample of his poetry. He's a great poet uh, and uh, perhaps a little bit neglected today but certainly worth reading uh, if, if you can get hold of one of his books of poems. So that was not an entirely cheerful poem, but certainly a lively one. I have a couple of other poems which again mix the sad with the happy. One is called The Eastern Gate. The Eastern Gate. And this ought to be popular and of interest in Hong Kong. A poor man determines to go out into the world and make his fortune. His wife tries to detain him. I went out to the eastern gate. I never thought to return. But I came back to the gate, my heart full of sorrow. There was not a peck of rice in the bin. There was not a coat hanging on the pegs. So I took my sword and went towards the gate. My wife and child clutched at my coat and wept. Some people want to be rich and grand. I only want to share my porridge with you. Above we have the blue waves of the sky below the yellow face of this little child. Dear wife, I cannot stay. Soon it will be too late. When one is growing old, one cannot put things off. So, there we are. <laughs> Uh, I have a very old one here by a 17th century writer called Robert Herrick and it's just a little poem he wrote uh, Cherry Ripe Cherry Ripe Cherry Ripe among other things and uh, he also wrote a poem called The Bell Man from noise of scare fires rest ye free, from murders bedesticity, from all mischances that may fright your pleasing slumbers in the night. Mercy secure ye all and keep the goblin from ye while ye sleep. Past one o'clock and almost two, my masters all. Good day to you. There was a popular writer in the uh, late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, called Alfred Noyes, N-O-Y-E-S. And one of his most well-known poems, and most popular, is called The Highwayman. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seals. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding 
up to the old inn door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doeskin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and climbed in the dark inn yard. He tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn yard, a stable wicket creaked, where Tim the ostler listened, his face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like mouldy hay, but he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog he listened, and he heard the robber say, Oh, kiss my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement. His face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast and he kissed its waves in the moonlight. Oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight. Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning. He did not come at noon. And o'er oh, the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a red coat troop came marching marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they gagged his daughter and they bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement with muskets at their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They had tied her up to attention with many a sniggering jest. I hate these people. <laughs> they had bound a musket beside her with the musket beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, they said and kissed her. She heard the dead man say, look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight. I come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness and the hours crawled by like years, till now on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger at least was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood, up to attention, with the muzzle beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing, she would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Tot, 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 had they heard it? 
the horse tubes ringing near, tot, 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 tot in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwaymen came riding, riding, riding. The red coats looked to their priming. She stood up, straight and still, tit tot, tot flot in the frosty silence, tot flot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west. He did not know who stood bowed with her head or the musket drenched with her own blood. Not till the dawn he heard it and his face grew grey to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shouting a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with the bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, riding, riding. A highwayman comes riding up to the old inn door. O'er the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard, and he taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, what does it say? Whatever it is. Well, L R A M. L R A M. Licentiate of the Royal Academy of Music. And L G. And licentiate of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. And it seemed to me that these would, those would be quite useful. I was the head of a department of English in Singapore, and it seemed to me that the least I could do was try to, as it were, take these particular examinations. So I had six months <coughs> leave, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, and spent most of the six months um, working on those two diplomas, which fortunately turned out all right. I. Uh, I went to see a lady who was recommended to me, and uh, she was a very, very much a big wig, very much important lady in one of the organisations that, that uh, pushed the idea of good speech. Um, so I remember going to see her, it was a foggy, cold evening, the first time I went to see her, she said, what could I do for you? Uh, I said, I would like to eventually take these two examinations. Oh, <laughs> have you done it before? I said, well, I've done this and that and the other. Right, she said, we'll, uh, we'll start now. <laughs> uh, speak up, speak up. <coughs> so then she said, you will have to come to my regular classes. They're in such and such a place in London, and uh, you must come once a week to these classes. So I went to these classes, a mix of students. Uh, so I, I wasn't able to choose, but if I was able to choose, had been able to choose, I would have chosen the group that I had. Because they were all girls, they were very willing to help. I, when I said to them, you are a class of five-year-olds, or you are a class of twelve-year-olds, they all agreed. <laughs> and they immediately became five-year-olds or twelve-year-olds. They were very cooperative. I've <laughs> never quite found out why. But anyway, they were, they were most helpful. So the moral is, if you ever take that exam, always make sure that you have uh, a group of girls or a group of boys on your side. They were on mine, anyway. No, I, I, uh, I used to do a lot of broadcasting in those days of what was called Radio Malaya, news reading and so on, so it all sprang out of that. <coughs>